Hello and welcome to Tala Talks NICU or welcome back to Tala Talks NICU where we break down medical concepts and make them super easy for you to understand. Hopefully they'll help you at the bedside and hopefully these videos will also help you pass exams. A lot of you have written to us and told us that they have so that makes us very happy, thank you. Today we are going to be talking about clotting factors and then several of you have asked us this specific question and you have to kind of understand clotting factors to truly understand this but a lot of you have asked us when do we give FFP and when do we give cryoprecipitate so watch on and hopefully you'll know. First let's go over the coagulation pathways or the pathways that end up with a fibrin clot being formed, which is kind of like the first kind of step of that scab being formed. The coagulation pathways are very much kind of like dominoes all lined up in a line. So something has to trigger it, and then they kind of all fall over until the final goal is achieved. Like, like at the end of the domino trail, maybe the ball goes off into a basket or whatever. Obviously, the final achievement in the coagulation pathways is that you get this fibrin clot. These pathways or all these interactions are set up by two different pathways that then end up in this common pathway. And you can see this all on the diagram that, like I said, will eventually end up with kind of like this fibrin mesh. So just kind of as an aside, I don't remember all the details of these pathways. There are just a few things that you should understand and remember that you then need to be able to apply clinically. Obviously, if we're about to do an exam, then you probably should be learning these off by heart. The two different pathways are the extrinsic and the intrinsic pathway. The extrinsic pathway is activated when the endothelial blood cell layer is damaged or injured. And obviously the endothelial cell layer is kind of the inner layer of the blood vessel. When the endothelial cells get injured, then they release a factor called tissue factor. Tissue factor then activates factor seven. Factor seven is the main factor in the extrinsic pathway, which then activates factor 10 and then kind of goes on downwards the common pathway. So factor 10 is actually in the common pathway. The intrinsic pathway is activated by collagen, and you can see that it involves many more factors, so including 12, 11, 9, and 8. Von Willebrand factor, which I'm sure you've all heard of, is a glycoprotein that stabilizes factor 8, so it's kind of also a part of the intrinsic pathway. Now, if you're missing any of these factors in the extrinsic or intrinsic or the common pathways, then basically there is a gap in the pathway and you're not going to be able to actually form the fibrin clot. So you are at an increased risk of bleeding. And by the way, these factors are not very redundant. So it's not kind of like platelets that babies normally have 250,000 platelets, but we don't really have any issues with bleeding unless they get to like below 25,000. With, for example, hemophilia, which is a deficiency of factor eight, it, babies are born with it, it's a genetic deficiency. So um, they would be diagnosed with hemophilia if they have less than 40% of factor eight. Um, depending on how little factor eight they have, they would have a more severe hemophilia. But really, if you have just under half of what you need, then you actually have a deficiency of these factors. Now, the two most commonly used measurements in medicine to check if a patient has an increased risk of bleeding is the PT, which is the prothrombin time, as well as the APTT, which is the activated partial thromboplastin time. The higher the APTT and the PT are, then it means that the baby has a higher chance of bleeding. It means that it takes longer for that baby to form a clot. The PT measures the extrinsic pathway and the common pathway, as you can see, and a normal PT is about 12 to 15 seconds. Normally, the younger the baby, the slightly higher the PT. And the APTT measures the intrinsic pathway as well as the common pathway. And a normal APTT in a neonate is somewhere around 25 to 30 seconds. Let's give an example of this clinically. Let's say you have a patient with hemophilia, which is, as we've said, factor eight deficiency. Factor eight is part of the intrinsic pathway. So if you measured the APTT and the PT 
on a patient with hemophilia, then their APTT would be elevated, but their PT would be normal, because like we said, the intrinsic pathway is affected, not the extrinsic. What about if a patient had a severe vitamin K deficiency? Now we've said in the past that the factors that need vitamin K to be produced are factors 10, 9, 7, and 2. So remember the mnemonic 1972. Obviously, those factors are involved in both the extrinsic and the intrinsic pathways. So if you have a severe vitamin K deficiency, then you would expect an elevation in both your PT as well as your APTT. Interestingly, when you don't have enough vitamin K, the first factor to be affected is factor seven, which as you all know, is the factor in the extrinsic pathway. So with a mild vitamin K deficiency, it's possible that you have just an elevated PT, but your APTT is normal. Another disease process that could affect or increase both the APTT as well as the PT is something called DIC, which is disseminated intravascular coagulopathy. DIC happens when a really bad stress on the baby has caused the coagulopathy or the coagulation pathways to become completely out of control. So they are overstimulated and you're ending up with like a lot of little clots everywhere being formed. And so you're also using up all those proteins and you're also kind of, the body's also trying to get rid of all those clots. So you're also not only forming the clots much quicker, but you're also at increased risk of bleeding. We see DIC pretty commonly, unfortunately, in the NICU. And so I really will talk about it in another video. But for now, just realize that you can guess that it's DIC when like the whole coagulation pathway is being affected. The APTT, the PT is going up, platelets are going down. Normally the babies are anemic. And we can see it in many disease processes. So like in a sepsis, in neck, or even in like a really severe HIE. You probably don't really have to remember the pathways and how they individually affect the APTT or, and the PT. But if you do want to remember, then I came up with this mnemonic when I was in medical school and it's still stuck. So realize that the in the extrinsic pathway, really the only factor or one of the few exclusive factors is factor seven. So the way that I used to remember it is sexy PT. So S for factor seven, X, so extrinsic, and then PT is what we use to measure the extrinsic pathway. I know it's silly. I highly encourage that you come up with your own. Just two little asides here. I'm sure you've all seen INR written right next to the PT. INR stands for International Normalized Ratio. And basically it's really kind of a unit that takes into account all the different ways that PT is tested internationally. And really it's kind of the ratio of what your PT is compared to what it should be. So if your INR is two, then that means that your PT is really kind of the double of what we would expect it to be. The other aside is that APTT and PTT are basically the same test using slightly different reagents. A is just for activated, so it's just kind of like a different reagent used. Um, because they're slightly different tests, but basically still measuring the intrinsic pathway, then they might have a slightly different range of units, but effectively they're kind of measuring the same thing. Okay, so where does fibrinogen come into this? If you look back at the pathways, you can see that fibrinogen is really a component of the common pathway at the end of the coagulation cascade. However, PT and APTT don't reliably measure the fibrinogen. And so if you really do want to know the fibrinogen level, then you should send it separately. A normal fibrinogen level is somewhere between 250 to 350 milligrams per deciliter and a baby could have a low fibrinogen level because they are in DIC, like we already talked about, which just uses up everything, um, could also be in liver failure, or they could just be born with a congenital deficiency of fibrinogen. So what do we do if we have an elevated APTT, an elevated PT, or a really low fibrinogen? Well, we generally have to replace with blood products, and this is where FFP and cryoprecipitate come in. So remember, whole blood is divided into red blood cells, white blood cells, 
platelets and plasma. And if you centrifuge down all of blood, then you'll end up with about 55% of it being the plasma. Now remember, plasma has like all the coagulation proteins and all the other proteins that you would find in blood. If a person donates blood and very soon after they donated it, you centrifuge it down and you get the plasma component. So the plasma is fresh and then you freeze that fresh plasma, then you will end up with fresh frozen plasma or FFP. This preserves all the proteins in the plasma. So FFP is a really rich source of all the coagulation factors that can be found in blood. So if all the factors are being used up, like in DIC, or the factors are just not being made in a severe vitamin K deficiency or in liver failure, then you can give FFP to try to replace as many of those factors as possible. Obviously in that situation, the PT and the PTT would probably be elevated. Or for example, an infant had a huge bleed or you're giving a double volume exchange transfusion. So remember in both those cases, whole blood is leaving the baby's body. So it's not just the red blood cells that are leaving the baby's body, all the coagulation factors are also leaving. So if you're giving loads of red blood cells back, because that's actually what the transfusion is, just the packed red blood cells, then at some point you also have to think about replacing some of those coagulation factors, which is why when we're doing a double volume exchange transfusion, we reconstitute the red packed cells with the FFP. And that's what we end up transfusing to the babies, just to make sure that they don't end up really deficient in their coagulation factors. And the dose we normally give of um, FFP whenever you're giving it is somewhere between 10 to 20 mLs per kilo. And normally we give it over about an hour instead of kind of the three hours that we normally give packed red blood cells over. Interestingly, cryoprecipitate is the portion of the FFP of the fresh frozen plasma that remains solid at four degrees Celsius as the FFP is being thawed out. It is really rich in fibrinogen, in factor eight, in von Willebrand factor, and in factor 13. So in the NICU, we're generally giving cryoprecipitate if the fibrinogen level is low. So definitely you want to be giving uh, cryoprecipitate if the fibrinogen level is less than 100 milligrams per deciliter. And then depending on the status of the baby, um, often we'll give it when it is less than 200 milligrams per deciliter too. Again, we normally give about 10 mLs per kilo of the cryoprecipitate too. Um, another couple of reminders. The first one is, is remember that FFP and cryoprecipitate are blood products. So you do need to obtain a blood consent from the parents. And also number two, remember that they are blood products and so they should be ABO compatible. So to summarize quickly, normally we give FFP when the PT and the APTT are elevated. And normally we give cryoprecipitate when the fibrinogen level is also low, because remember you have to send it separately, which is also normally in the setting of an elevated PT and an APTT. And that's it. I really hope that you learned something. Please remember to like this video and to subscribe if you haven't already done so. And really just thank you so much for being here.